So welcome to the uh, seminar of the Sony Astani Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. I'd like to introduce the speaker today, Robert Cantor. We are fortunate to have a very eminent speaker for today. Uh, Robert Cantor is a Managing Director of Environmental Affairs and Planning for the Port of Long Beach. And he has been holding this appointment since March 2007. Robert oversees the Environmental Affairs and Planning Bureau, which includes three divisions, Environmental Planning, Master's Planning, and Transportation Planning. These divisions are involved in environmental planning and regulatory, compl uh, re regulatory compliance issues, land use, cargo forecasting, and legislative affairs, as well as transportation planning. Dr. Cantor, was also one of the chief architects of the Green Port Policy and the San Pedro Bay Clean Air Action Plan, the most aggressive environmental programs adopted by any seaports in the world. Dr. Kendall serves as California Sports Representative on federal and state regulatory advisory committees and has served as a member of numerous environmental committees. Good part now, he received his master's degree and PhD in biology from USC. So we have here one of our famous Trojan to tell us about Port 101. Robert. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you for the warm reception. Um, this is a nice, intimate group, and I'm very happy to be here. It kind of feels like being back home. I walked by my office a couple times today, um, and uh, spent a lot of fun, fun days, fun nights there, uh, working on my degrees. Um, and I do look back really fondly at uh, my graduate uh, training here. Uh, it probably, truly was the best time of my life. You know, I, I, I'd, I'd come from Cal State, uh, Northridge as an undergraduate and it was a it was a great school got a great undergraduate education but it was still you know didn't have a football team and <laughs> so you know it was really nice to come here during the the heyday of uh, Anthony Davis and OJ and some of the other uh, names that s most of you guys weren't even born then but uh, you know it's it, it it's it's a great school academically I'm, I'm I'm just delighted I'm very proud of having come from here um, how many of you have been to any port, uh, or more importantly, how many of you have been to the ports of LA Long Beach? Well, it's not too bad. We've been maybe maybe thirty percent. Um, how many of you of of that group uh, have done work in ports? Uh, any any work, uh, studies, research, or whatever? We got a couple, so that's good. That's that's great. I know I've met with a couple of you. Um, Today I hope to give you a good feel for really what a port is. And I, I go out and I speak a, a lot of times to, to audiences and I, and I recognize after a while when I first started that a lot of people just don't have a clue how important the port is, how it operates, particularly the ports of LA and Long Beach. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, you know, how we relate to one another. But um, it's very important for you to understand how we operate and I think if, uh, as you look at careers, you're going to recognize uh, through my talk, I hope, that there are a lot of opportunities out there uh, in terms of the port-related industry. Um, and, and academia is just one part of it, because we do have researchers that participate in a lot of our projects. But as you move more into applied uh, uh, careers, either in, in, in engineering, um, in, <coughs> in public affairs, communications, um, all those things in the environment, uh, all those things uh, are provided uh, uh, opportunities, if you will, uh, at the port. And, and so today it's just, just like I said, Port 101, just so you understand where we come from and, and, and how we operate. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about uh, where we are, just physically located, and, and that's important because it really relates to the business that we do here in, in the greater uh, Southern California region. Um, 
There's public policies that, that, that govern some of our operations. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our internal organization and, and how that's structured. Then give you a better feel for the way we can implement or not uh, things that, that we do in the port. Um, a little bit about our business. You know, what, what type of business do we do? Why is that important to you? Why is it important to us uh, who live here? Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's really uh, interesting, I think, uh, and you can see for yourself whether you think it's interesting of, of why it's so important to you. Um, what my group does, I have a bureau of, of three divisions, and, and, and uh, as was stated, um, we, we have uh, a group that looks at master land use planning. How do we plan for the future? How do we use our land most efficiently and effectively? Um, what environmental policies are going to be uh, related to that? Uh, because we, we are stewards of, of, of that land that we call the harbor. And we need to make sure that we operate in a, in a very environmentally responsible manner. And so there are policy issues associated with that. Um, there are those at one extreme or the other. Uh, people at the extreme of the business end would you know, go damn the environment. And the guys at the, at the other end of the spectrum with the environmental end would say damn the, this, this commerce. You know, we, we need preservation. And so what I hope to show you today is the delicate balancing act that, that we perform in, in our day, daily activities at the port. Um, and our future challenges. Um, today more than ever we're, we're facing uh, a, a new world of challenges uh, environmentally, um, economically, uh, business-wise, uh, there's a lot of people out there that would love to, to have the economic benefits that we enjoy here in Southern California uh, at, the two, at, at the two ports. So a little bit about um, where we're geographically. Do I have a, a pointer here? Or, uh, or I don't know if I can do that with a... Yeah, I can do that. Can you see the arrow? Oh, no, that wouldn't. that's not good because I, I end up advancing the advancing the slides. All right, well, I'm just going to walk up to the screen here, and I don't know if that's going to show. Um, but basically, this is the Port of Long Beach. And there's actually a, a line that divides Los Angeles on this side from Long Beach on that side, and it kind of runs like that. Some things I'd like to point out to you that are important. This is the Los Angeles River. You can see where it exits. Historically, it actually dumped into the, to the, to the harbor. There's a big breakwater out here. Let me talk a little bit about that. That, that provides the protection uh, that we need to keep, keep the operations quiet. Okay. Um, so this is a, a breakwater that actually connects out to Palos Verdes, to, to the Point Furman. Um, this was an area that was formerly the, the uh, Long Beach Naval Complex uh, during the, the early uh, the 40s, 50s, and right at really up until the early 90s, uh, which we have now uh, converted into uh, uh, use as, for part of the port. This is our inner harbor here. This is Dominguez Channel. For those of you who know the area, this is a, a small uh, waterway that actually goes pretty far inland and it has a lot of industrial activities there. And one of the most important things is this is where the city is. This is where people live, also known as sensitive receptors. People that would be impacted by port operations if we weren't conscientious about that. So we have to be cognizant of that all the time. And LA has a similar challenge with their communities right here. And I'm not going to tell you more about that. That's Brand X. We just compete with them. And, and, we're, and, we're, and we're kicking, kicking their uh, tail. So. Um, Port opened up in 1911, first, uh, first ship that called carried lumber. Uh, Iaqua came from the uh, Pacific Northwest, and that's a picture, one of the historical photographs of it. Um, we're governed by a board of harbor commissioners. Uh, those commissioners are appointed by the mayor, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the port is a landlord. Just like your landlord, if you're renting an apartment, we rent our land to we rent our land to various. I have that going here. <laughs> we rent our land to various tenants, and those tenants operate these terminals. Those those leases that they sign run many years, 20, 30 years. 
We have a provision to open those up periodically for the purpose of, of basically uh, increasing the rent and other uh, factors that are very limited, but we can open up those leases, and that's important. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. And our primary mission, really to facilitate international trade, but to do it responsibly, be environmentally sensitive and protect the environment while basically encouraging the trade that is so economically important to all of us. The, the port area, that geographic area I, I showed you, um, was granted to the city of Long Beach uh, in, a, in a trust. We are actually, the, the board is actually trustees of, of what we call the Tidelands. And so there's certain things that the state has spelled out that you must do as a, as a, as a, as a trustee. That, that trust, you, you take care of those lands for not only the people of Long Beach in Southern California, but really for the entire state of the nation. It does not belong to Long Beach. The money generated there does not belong to Long Beach. It actually belongs to the state and to the, to the federal government. And that's important. Um, and I'll, uh, again, touch a little bit more on that as we go along. Um, the uses are restricted. And basically, those uses are for commerce, navigation, and, and fisheries. And, and we'll talk some more about that. Um, the, as I mentioned, the Tidelands Law provides guidance to us in a very generic sense of what can happen. And it's, it's really water-dependent uses. If you can do something somewhere else, and you don't, don't need to have the waterfront as, as, as a place where you've sited your facility, then you must do that. So um, today there have been many businesses that approach us and, and say, oh, we want to put a asphalt manufacturing facility there in the port uh, because it's, it's, it, it, we're going to import gravel to put into asphalt. Well, you can actually still import the gravel, but you can manufacture that asphalt you know, in Mojave. So you don't need to have a, s a facility there for manufacturing. You do need the wharf there to bring the gravel across that you brought from wherever, Canada, Mexico, or whatever. Um, I've said it that, uh, again, we earn money from commerce, navigation, and fisheries, and we can only spend it <coughs> on the same. That's important. We do not get tax revenue. We generate revenue from our operation and management of the port. No taxpayer money. Matter of fact, we provide money back to the government, back to the state, back to the feds, back to the city. There, there is uh, the California Coastal Act also is part of our governance. Um, it, it is, it is uh, basically a, uh, an act of the, the California State Legislature that dictates all the multiple uses that our coastline can be used for. And those include recreation, surfing, sunbathing, and ports. There's a, there's a, a, a chapter that actually talks about ports, chapter eight. And it, 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 what it really is aimed at is making sure that we have ports and all the important benefits that they bring, but we don't have ports up and down the entire coast. That we preserve other parts of the coast for other uses of the shoreline. And we restrict the impacts of a harbor to certain areas. And it also encourages us to keep those facilities up, be environmental stewards, and upgrade and improve those facilities as we go forward in the future. As I mentioned, our Board of Harbor Commissioners is, is appointed by the mayor. They each have a six-year term. There's five of them. The mayor's term is only four years. So what do you see there? The good thing about that is that when that mayor's out of office, you've still got continuity in the governance of the port because it extends over the period of a political appointment. And that's, that's a very important difference than from, of Long Beach from Los Angeles. When a new mayor comes in, he just offs everybody and then you get a new Board of Harbor Commissioners. And at least from my perspective, I don't think that's as healthy because I think you need the continuity for basically management and long-term planning purposes. Our commissioner set policy, and we and the staff implement it. My boss is the executive director uh, of the port, um, and he oversees all of the day-to-day -day staff activities. Our board's uh, rulings and uh, decisions are final. The only time we ever go to our city council for anything 
is for two things. If we're going to go into bonded indebtedness, that is, we're going to float bonds out there to finance a project, and that really obligates us uh, in, a, in a debt situation, we need to get the city council's approval. And the second one is, is once a year we go and we show them what our budget is. So outside of that, decisions are final at the port, and that's good. And again, that's a contrast to our neighbor, Los Angeles, which after they've been approved by their board of commissioners, then it still has to go to their city council. And every time you elevate you know, your decisions to a, a political uh, group, you have politics entering into the decision making, and that's not, not always healthy. And as I said before, we received no tax revenue. And the last one is very important. The city of Long Beach, we use the economies of things that they have established. They have a police force. They have a fire department. They have a payroll department. So we pay the city for those services. So we pay for fire that, that operates fire boats and fire stations within the port. And, and uh, I get my paycheck from the city of Long Beach. They do all the processing and, and so on. So again, we, we pay for services that we receive from the city. How do we stay involved? Very, very important. Because there's always someone who has a better idea about running the port. Some of it is good idea. Some of them are good ideas. Some of them aren't so good. And we, we don't want to be at the whim of everybody's great idea. So we get up there and we have eyes and ears at both the, 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 the state and the federal level in terms of advocating for the ports. So they're there when legislation is, is uh, proposed to keep us apprised of that. And uh, sometimes we want to introduce legislation, either at the state or the federal level. Again, we have advocates that we hire, just like uh, any other company would do, to, to uh, put forth our, our ideas that, are, that represent our board's desire. Um, we do an awful lot of educating, just like I'm doing with, with you guys today. We go out and we try to educate people who don't know much about the port, particularly legislators and, and those guys that are going to pass rules and regulations on us. We want them to understand how we operate so that they don't pass something that is foolhardy. Uh, Eric Shen, who uh, is on my staff, and uh, he, he is constantly out there educating people in Sacramento, in local counties and cities and so on about how we operate so that they have a better idea when they are going for transportation funding, when they want to tax something, whatever. Um, we think it's very, very important to engage and educate, critical. Uh, for many years we didn't do that and we found people were just passing all kinds of silly things that just wouldn't work and putting us in a, a very disadvantaged <laughs> position. We participate in professional and trade associations. All of the technical people where I work, uh, Eric, myself, we, we are members of, uh, of professional associations. We write, we, we write papers, we uh, participate in conferences, give presentations, um, we're on boards and, and so on. We stay involved and engaged and we encourage uh, everybody at the port to do that. So my staff is encouraged, even the most junior staff coming in, we get them engaged in, in this so that they can later on do what I'm doing, come out and talk to folks and, and educate. Um, and we have state and national um, associations of, of ports. One in California is called the California Association of Port Authorities, CAPA. And, it, and they really as a group band together and look out for the best interests of, of the West Coast ports. Then there's a national organization called the American Association of Port Authorities and they look over uh, and represent, if you will, the ports in North America, not just the United States, but also Canada and, and S Central and South America, uh, Mexico, um, and our best interests. How do we compete in a, in a global economy? And so how, how, how can we together advocate for certain things in and, and, and an, and a level playing field, which is, which is really important. Let's talk a little bit about what, our, what we handle at the port. I, I'm giving you 2008 figures. We're just really compiling most of our 2009, but the, the trend is pretty, very, or pretty similar here. Imports, our, our largest imports, and we got kind of them ranked there. By, by weight, crude oil by far is, is, is the biggest import. Um, it also has a, a, a huge dollar uh, va value, but it also varies quite a bit, as you guys know, with petroleum prices. Uh, we import a lot of electronics, all your iPods, TVs, those kind of things. Plastics, furniture, and clothing. And by value, uh, you know, some of the same pieces of, uh, uh, up here. You've got televisions, electronic equipment, that, that, computers, vehicles, cars, uh, heavy-duty heavy uh, 
equipment, uh, bulldozers and the like that are manufactured overseas. Surprisingly, video games, you know, that was, that, that's just made the list over the last couple of years. It was never on the radar screen before, but as you know how, how uh, video games have, have grown in popularity, and they're expensive, many of them are expensive, um, they're also a high value cargo that comes into the port, and obviously crude oil. What do we export? Well, as a general statement, we probably export more um, raw materials for uh, other countries to, to manufacture and to finish products and then send them back for us to buy. Um, but they include petroleum coke, which is an interesting product. That, that is, um, when, when crude oil comes in and it's taken to the refinery and refined in gasoline and alcohol and all the lubricating oils are taken off, what remains at the bottom is a very concentrated carbon source. And that carbon source is known as petroleum coke. And that actually can be burnt as a fuel, but it tends to be somewhat dirty. So it's only limited applications here in the United States. But there are other countries around the world, particularly in Japan, that, that use a lot of petroleum coke in, in uh, power plants and the like for fuel. So it's exported as a, as a commodity. So in a sense, it's a byproduct of our refining process, and it's exported, and it has value. There's also a very refined uh, type of petroleum coke that is used in, in, in metal uh, fabricating, in, in, in the aluminum, uh, uh, fabrication of aluminum, very fine uh, additive. Obviously, refined uh, products such as chemicals, uh, refined uh, gasolines, uh, alcohols, and the like. Waste paper is a big one that goes out, comes back as your cardboard boxes, as your packaging, and so on for a lot of the commodities com uh, that, we, that we import. Uh, and again, very specialized chemicals uh, manufactured. By value, stuff that's exported in machinery, plastic, vehicles, a, a lot of cars that are manufactured in the United States are exported overseas. Um, electrical machinery, uh, iron and steel. Um, in the electrical realm and machinery realm, there's also a lot of medical related uh, equipment that is, that is manufactured in the United States and that's exported and that has high value and it's a, it's a very important commodity. Our largest trading partners. Uh, we, we lump China and, and Hong Kong. Uh, about 42% of our trade is with uh, China. Uh, Japan is, is, a, is the next on the list, and you can see it's a big drop. So the dominant trading partner is, is China. Um, when I started at the port, China was about 4%, uh, that's about 20 years ago, 4 to 5%. And now it's, it's, it's very dominant in, 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 the, in the marketplace here, obviously. Korea, Taiwan. Uh, we have you know, Mexico and Iraq, mostly because of, because of oil. Um, a, a still a very dominant uh, trading partner. Where do we rank in the world? There, the, you could see where LA and Long Beach from the outside world is viewed as kind of one port, even though we are actually two separate ones here for business purposes. From the rest of the world, it just goes, it's going to Southern California. So it comes into LA, Long Beach. We're down to fifth. Uh, and uh, separately, we're, we're way down the list, 17th, 18th, if, you, if that's what these, these numbers, I'm sorry. Uh, these numbers here, if we're ranked individually. But as a, as a group, we have 14.3. The ranking is based on containers. It could be on a lot of other commodities, but those metal boxes, which are called 20-foot units, it's like a 20-foot equivalent uh, box. Many of them are double that size, they're 40-foot, but that's equal to two 20-foot. And the abbreviation T-E-U means 20-foot equivalent unit. So you'll see that that acronym, and that's, that's how these stats are, are compiled. The big ones are Singapore, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. And th those aren't quite realistic numbers that you see up there because those are areas where they do a lot of exchanging of boxes, where they, they bring feeder ships into uh, a, a, a harbor and many times transfer the, the containers off of those uh, feeder ships onto the big ships to then come across the Pacific. So it's a little misleading how many boxes are actually moved there. They aren't, they aren't imported into Shanghai. It's probably more than there are people there, uh, 29 million. But, but uh, what, what it happens is that's just the amount of container boxes that are moved there. Um, but you can see where we are here. Not too far behind us is Busan and Dubai, Ningbo. 
uh, Guangzhou. And quite honestly, I, I, I see LA Long Beach slipping down that list as, as some of these other ports really grow, particularly in China. We're going to start seeing uh, US, uh, LA Long Beach starting to drop in terms of volume down there through, through the years. Um, here we are in the, if we're just ranked with the U.S. ports, Long Beach is number two. You know, I was telling, uh, I don't know, someone earlier, that, you know, we're happy to be number two when we, we try harder. Um, the uh, Los Angeles is n number one at, at 7.8. And actually, a few years ago, we were number one for, for many years, and then we switched off. They stole one of our big customers, and so then we went down to number two. Uh, New York, New Jersey. Um, there's a lot of reasons. I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're successful. The, actually, the, truly, LA and Long Beach will ultimately be almost pretty much equal in size when everything is filled up as much as we can take capacity-wise in the two ports. There's a finite limit to how much uh, commerce we can handle. One of my groups, the uh, Land Use Planning Group, does economic forecasting. It's a little bit of crystal ball and a little bit of science mixed together to try and tell us where we're going to be so we can plan facilities um, going forward. And the uh, blue line is actually our forecast line. And that was just, we did a, a revision as of this economic downturn. So we actually you know, do have something that shows this, this current period of, of downturn. But if you look at this general trend, there's where we're gonna end up. And we've been pretty, we've been actually exceeding what our forecasts were. So our forecasts were rather conservative. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I feel per very conf confident that we will be up in, in these kind of numbers going forward. And if you, if you think about that, that's more than double uh, by 2030, 2035, uh, you're, we're going to be up there around 34 million between the two ports. And, th and that's, that's huge. That's a lot of imports. Now, there's a lot of other factors out there in the world that, that could change, but for, based on everything we know today, that, that's a pretty big number, and, our, and like I said, our forecasting has been pretty, pretty darn close. What's the capacity on uh, That's the capacity, the, the actual capacity right there is, is about 34.7. Um, as, as, as current um, land and birthing is, is looked at, and with some improvements, there are things that could change that. And you guys, some of you in the audience might be able to help influence that as automation and some other ways to use the, use the terminal land more efficiently in time um, will, will help change that. But for, we had to make certain conventional assumptions because we don't know what the future will bring. And so this is more uh, conservative. Yes? Is it about 50-50 between Portland and the Long Beach? Roughly. You saw the figures. Of there. They were at last year at 7.5 million, and we were at six or 7.8 million, and we were at 6.5 million. So you know, 45 to 55, like that right now. Ultimately, they'll be pretty close. Yeah. Economic benefits. First off, I don't know if if if, if this really strikes home, but I want you to understand that 40 percent of the entire nation's cargo for our entire United States comes through LA Long Beach. So if you think about that in terms of importance, it means we're pretty important. If, we, if, if for some reason we couldn't operate as we do today, for whatever reason, a, a, an earthquake, a, a terrorist attack, whatever, it could have a significant impact on everybody in the United States, not just us here in Southern California. Um, another important fact, about 50%, actually a little bit more than 50%, of those goods that come in are consumed right here in Southern California. We have 17, over 17 million people in this greater Southern California region, and we consume a lot of those goods. We're like a small nation in and of ourselves. We're, we're much bigger than, I think we're ranked like, a, if we were a country, we'd be like 11th in the world in terms of our, our population. So that gives you some perspective. Um, the rest of it is what we call intermodal or discretionary cargo, and, and it, it goes to the Midwest and to the East Coast. Uh, via train, um, not, not normally by truck. Um, the value of, of the trade, that is, every, if, you, if, you, if a dollar value was put on those television sets and the Nikes and the everything else, the, the, the equipment that comes through our ports, both LA and Long Beach, in 2008 the value was about 305 billion with a B. Big dollars, huge, huge value. Good news is that uh, it generates about $7 billion 
in customs revenue, that is when certain products come in, a, a duty is paid to the U.S. Uh, government as a customs duty, and so it generated about $7 billion in, in customs revenue to the, to the general fund, if you will. Um, locally, it generated over $100 billion in business sales revenue. In other words, all the goods that stayed here in Southern California and was sold generated sales tax and revenue again for the state, local, state, and federal governments. And this is just, th this, it talks, talks about the actual tax part. The other part is just the revenue for on sales, which translates into salaries and, and, and the like. Also translate, translates into economic prosperity. Again, this is what's very, very important about the ports is that just in Long Beach alone, we, we are responsible for over 30,000 jobs just in Long Beach, the city of Long Beach. That's about one in every eight jobs. It, 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 it's, it's quite an impact. In, in this greater five county region, LA, Orange, San Bernardino, Riverside, uh, what did I forget? Ventura. Ventura. Um, five counties, 315,000 jobs. Now again, this figure is just Long Beach. So roughly double that for the LA and Long Beach. And if you look nationally, again, you're looking at about 1.4 million jobs just from just kind of spin off from Long Beach. So double that roughly for LA Long Beach. Huge economic engine, huge employer. And these are jobs not only on the waterfront, but off of the waterfront. So it could be for people working on the docks, truck drivers, railroad, warehouse people, retail sales, ship brokers, ship provisioners, on and on. Again, a lot of jobs that just come as spin-off from port activity. Why are we doing so well? Well, location is one of it. We've got a population of 17 million people. We're in a great sunny spot. Great weather year-round, pretty much not, not hindering us for bringing imports in, becomes a great gateway for, for goods and a, and a logical gateway year-round. Gateway to the Pacific, we're closest to the Pacific Rim manufacturing, China, Japan, uh, you know, other uh, near and far east countries are manufacturing centers today, and those goods are coming in, in here, and it's actually quicker to bring goods into LA Long Beach and put them on one of our intermodal trains, take them to the Midwest and the East Coast, than it is to put on a ship and sail them all the way to the East Coast. And in today's world, which is used to just-in-time delivery, because people don't want to pay for warehouse space, that means that they can count on goods coming in just in time for them to use them in their manufacturing processes. And again, we've talked about the 17 million consumers. That's a, a good reason why we're here. This infrastructure number is actually a little bit outdated now because this is what we've already invested. And over the next uh, 10 years, uh, actually in the next three years, we have three projects slated for uh, construction, each one approaching a uh, billion dollars. So another three billion dollars in construction activity of infrastructure uh, over the next uh, three, to, three to five years. Other reasons why Long Beach, uh, you know, is so successful. We're run like a business. As I mentioned, the, you know, the politicians don't get to dabble too much in, our, in how we operate. We run lean and mean. Eric will tell you, he just came in trying to hire someone else and I said, Eric, no. You know, you can't hire anybody else. Did you leave? Oh. Um, but uh, we, we have a staff of about just under 400 people for running our port. And just, again, for comparison's sake, recognizing that LA and Long Beach are about the same in terms of business and, and responsibility, they have 1,200 people, almost three times the staff. So we do, we do the same amount of work, roughly, as they do with uh, uh, basically a third of the, of the, of the resources. We have a very strong leasing policy. We want to get return on our investment. We want to pay back our investment quickly within about 10 years. Because again, these leases land, last 20, 30 years. So after, certain, after getting back the money that we put into the infrastructure, we are then collecting, if you will, excess revenue. We're not a profit-making organization, but that gives us money to, to rebuild and to put new infrastructure in and improve our, our facilities. And our, our, we have very strong uh, policies in terms of our investments and our, and our bonding. 
Um, we ask for an appropriate return, so that means what we charge people for our, for our terminals. We want to make sure we get good return on that money. We focus on cargo handling. There are other ports around the, 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 the world and the United States that focus on different things. San Diego, for example, is cruise terminals and tourism and the like. We're strictly cargo. And, and uh, we're a multi, what, what we call a multi-service cargo entity. That is, we don't just do containers. We do petroleum coke. We do uh, crude oil. We do cars. We do cement. We do gravel. We do slab steel. We, you know, we, we handle a big array of products, wood. And so that gives us a, a, a lot of stability in terms of the product mix that we, that we handle. We, ha we look forward and, and actively plan and implement new uh, infrastructure projects to improve the infrastructure. And all that is balanced with environmental uh, policies that we are very, very proud of and probably cutting edge. I, I, I'm really absolutely shocked at, at, at what's going on in other parts of the world. And people come up to me and just can't believe we're doing what we're doing. They don't know how we do it. And I think part of the reason we do it is because we have strong leadership from our board who wants us to have an responsible environmental policies. But they also put money where their mouth is. They support us. When I come up with ideas for environmental improvement, my board has been very supportive in terms of dollars because it doesn't happen without money there. Part of what has caused the ports to continue to have to reinvest is the evolution of vessels. And this just gives you an idea. Uh, again, these, these figures over here, the length or the, the capacity is what you should focus on. If you look at starting at 750 uh, 20-foot equivalent units, TEUs, 20-foot 20, uh, 20 boxes, uh, back in the, you know, the 60s. And today, we're looking at ships that are bringing over 11,000 of those uh, containers and, and uh, all at once. Now, if you think about offloading those, think about the land area, the acreage that's needed to, to put those boxes down. Let's say you took off the entire ship's worth and changed it out. You'd have to have a lot of space to spread that stuff out. And, and it takes a, a number of days and a lot of logistics to do that. So we have container ships now that are over 8,000 TEUs. They not only require the land, but they also require deeper water. So they need at least 55 feet just, just so they don't touch bottom. And you, know, you want to have some cl clearance there so, so you have another five feet. So you've got to have deep water. We're fortunate. LA Long Beach has very deep water for the most part. And where we didn't have historical deep water, we've dredged to make the water deeper. So we have entrance channel in Long Beach that's 76 feet deep. So we can take the biggest super tankers carrying crude oil and bring them through there and uh, offload them. And again, it's very efficient. And in an environmental sense, it's good because in the old days, because you couldn't bring a ship that was fully laden into the harbor, you had to offload oil off offshore. And the chance of a spill or leakage or something like that w was always there. So, so we're really happy with that. Intermodalism is take shifting your cargo from one mode of transportation to another. So when we talk about intermodal cargo, it's usually in reference to things that come off the vessel and we put them onto trucks or on the trains and we move the goods out. This is kind of how goods move. And I'm, I'm, I could spend an hour talking about this. I'm just going to touch on it briefly. But you, if you start at the water, you've got basically a ship that's offloading. You have some of the containers that don't need to go anywhere locally and don't need to be open for any reason. They put them on rail right in our harbor, in, in Long Beach particularly. We have on-dock rails. So we have rail spurs right on the terminals. And we just take them off the vessel, put them right on a train, and psh, they're out of there. Some of those that need to be moved, uh, they'll, they'll be taking the near dock rail yards if we, can't, if we don't have the capacity on dock. And so these are you know, very close in Carson and, and, and Wilmington. Um, or off dock rail yards in downtown uh, LA, right where the 5 and the 710 interchange is a huge rail yard. And that's where rails, are, uh, let's see, poles, so we call them, a bunch of cars are linked together to be pulled to certain parts of the United States. So a bunch of cars might be all linked that are going to go to you know, Kansas City uh, and to Chicago and so on. And they're built there in the, in the yard. Um, direct delivery is the other part. That is, the stuff that's consumed by you and me and uh, you know, at our local Walmart, you can't take it there by train. You've got to take it there by truck. 
So it's loaded directly on the trucks, taken to directly to local warehouses, or sometimes there's an intermediate stop at the warehouse where they break up a, a, a box, like it might be a box of 1,000 TVs, and they want 20 of them to go to Tustin and 10 of them to go to Cerritos, and so they, they break them up and they send them off on smaller trucks. So that's transloading. So the, so the challenge is, is basically looking forward, looking at how we're going to meet the demands that, that are coming at us. As I showed you in an earlier slide, we're, we're going to be bringing in more cargo. How do, we, how do we move that cargo efficiently? How do we reduce the environmental impacts associated with moving that cargo? And basically, we, we, we set out our objectives. Are we going to be moving containers? What do we want, how do we want to move them and where do we want to move them? And we do the cargo forecasting. We update that periodically to make sure we're still on track so that we have a way to do our land use planning. Then we identify all our existing facilities. So this, this terminal is a car terminal. This terminal is a gravel terminal. This terminal is a container terminal. L looking forward, am I going to not need the gravel terminal anymore, hypothetically? And am I going to want to convert that land into a, a, a cargo handling for, let's say, containers? So we have to start looking at long-range land use planning. And so that's where the needed facilities are. We develop strategies to get to those. That is, we look at when the lease that is currently there is up, what environmental documents need to be written on a new, excuse me, terminal. And then we plot a course to get out there and construct it. And of course, we have to ev evaluate any environmental issues associated with that path moving forward. So we have environmental policies that are again always in the forefront of how we operate at the Port of Long Beach and these policies really are what guides my shop you know everything that I do in, in my, with my environmental planning group um, it really looks at this we want to demonstrate that we are a, a leader in the world and we are um, and we want to use we want to be innovative we want to use technology we want to continually improve the the quality of the environment we have a legacy from the past. Fortunately, it's getting much, much better. But when I say legacy of the past, there wasn't the environmental concerns that, were th that there are today. And so even that property that I, s I talked about, which was Navy property that we now own, when the Navy left, they left a bunch of contaminated sediment. And they left a bunch of contaminated soil. And they left a bunch of contaminated groundwater. So as we redevelop those areas, we're cleaning that up. So it's a win for the environment and it's a win for the economy. We clean up the, the mess and we put that land back into pr productive use. And that's very, very important. We want to protect the communities and that pr primarily relates to air quality. As, as we have these mobile sources that have engines that burn petroleum products, we need to make sure that th that is reduced, minimized or eliminated uh, so that that air quality impact is, is not falling on the local communities. And our philosophy is you don't have to sacrifice international trade. You don't have to sacrifice the environment. You can have both, but you have to be smart about it. This is how our Greenport policy is structured. Again, you look at the various areas. You have our, our kind of guiding philosophies to protect the community from the harmful effects of our port operation. Make sure that people recognize we're a, we're a leader out there. We want to promote sustainability. And that's not just a buzzword for us. It means sustainable purchasing, sustainable uh, design, and sustainable operations. So our buildings are, are LEED certified. Um, our purchasing is green products, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we want to use technology to the maximum extent practical because we're not going to be able to do this without the help of technology. There's a lot of things that don't exist today that we need solutions, and it's going to come out of new technology. It's not going to come out of the old school. And it's important for us to do what I'm doing with you guys, is, is educate and engage the community. Bring out the scientists, bring out the engineers to help us. Also, let you understand what our challenges are and what, what careers are out there in terms of, of, of making this happen. We have strategies for each one of these areas of the environment. And those are publicly stated. We'll set up a, a goal, what we want to do, and we'll set up a measurement, and we'll report on it. And, and that's key, transparency, so that we're accountable. And when someone looks at it, particularly environmental groups who oppose a lot of port development, we want to make sure we can stand up proudly and say, we told you we were going to reduce pollution by this amount, and here you go, this is what we've done. Or in this area, we're not doing as well. We're going to have to redouble our efforts or change our, our strategies. 
So that's, that's really important. So we have a, 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 a what we call a master plan, that again comes out of my, my shop, where we look at where, where do we want to be in 10, 20, 30 years. We want to better utilize our assets. We've got a lot of money invested in this infrastructure, and we want to make sure that we use it to the maximum. So in the past, the terminals used to be open like 8 to 5, and now we're open almost 24-7. Okay, very, very important so that we maximize the, the use of that. We, we extend the gate hours, again, that's related to running 24-7. We want to institute technology. So at these gates, a lot of them are automated. We have optical character recognition. We have other electronic data tracking. We have GPS tracking on the containers. You have a container in the yard. It has a little tracking device on it, and people that are in their, their control tower on a terminal can tell you at any time where that, where that container is, what it contains, how long it's been there, and so on. So when someone comes to pick it up, we know right where to go, and so on. So again, that's, that's using technology. Im improving the efficiency at terminals is also important. I see a couple of people getting pretty warm and no nodding out. Can you crack that door a little and, and let a little air in without destroying the, the ambiance? No? We're locked in? <laughs> I, think that'll, I think that'll help. Thanks. Um, so we want to increase the efficiency of the terminals. And we have infrastructure that we need to use outside of the port. So we need to make sure that that's in, best, in the best condition it can be. It doesn't produce revenue to the port. We don't, we don't own it. Many times Caltrans owns it or railroads own it. <clears throat> but we can work to make sure that it's the best that can, is possible. So Eric Shen, who was here earlier, works on a lot of those transportation in the region, making sure that the rail and roadway and bridge work connections are all uh, uh, you know, kept up and, and uh, if you will, expanded for future use. So this is what our long range master land use plan and I, I'm not going to flip it back to the beginning, but you can see what we've, what we've done here is the, a lot of these terminals represent very large re, de, rebuilt um, land areas here and here, um, like right here. This is just right now uh, a, an oil, old oil field that we just cleaned up. Um, but this is ultimately where we'd like to be with master planning our land use for, for future. And we, up, we revisit this every couple of years to make sure that we're still on track or we might want to tweak it. Um, our, our future capital expenditure, like I said, was about $3 billion. This, is, this slide's a little outdated since we did some re-analysis of our, of our projects. Um, most of our terminals are going to be upwards of 300 acres, where in, in the past they were less than 100. The, again, when you have those huge ships, you need a lot of what we call backland acreage so that you can take off a lot of those containers and move them around. And you need water at least 50 feet deep, and in many areas deeper than that to accommodate the, these, these great ships. And so these are the issues to balance, the things that we've talked about. The obligations that we have as trustees of the, of the Tidelands, the growth demand. All of us that are consumers, every time we buy a second TV, another pair of Nikes, and we, we just keep buying and buying, that creates demand. The port does not build on speculation. We, we try to keep up with the demand that's out there. And, and all of us are people that contribute to that demand. We've got to develop. We obviously got to look at the environmental impacts of that development. We've got to make sure the infrastructure, and particularly infrastructure outside of the port, keeps up with our, with our needs. It doesn't do any good to rebuild the entire port and have a roadway that's totally clogged up and you can't get from here to there. So we have to make sure that that's done. So with that, I'll thank you, and I'd be happy to stick around for a few minutes and answer questions. So, I think we have a few questions for you again. So, yes. Um, the, uh, there are a couple of uh, state uh, uh, regulations, so like AD32 and uh, no carbon fuel uh, mm -hmm. standards, that, did, that both ports, mm -hmm. Long Beach mm -hmm. and uh, LA, are looking at very, very carefully, mm -hmm. particularly for long, long range. Mm -hmm. And we hear that Long Beach is looking at um, electrification, uh, electrification of, uh, of you know, dock, uh, the ship coming at the docking all the way through the CHEs and so um, are you guys in concert with, with uh, LA 
in terms of electrification? And, and if you are, uh, the follow-up question, how, how would you want to meet, meet that? Because eventually the, um, uh, the DWP, which, which is a provider of electricity, has to turn its uh, mix of, of fuel into a more alternative fuel in order to mm -hmm. lower the carbon, uh, the, the overall carbon. Okay, well, let me, let me try to answer pieces of that. And I'll answer the one first because of the relationship between L.A. and Long Beach. Right. Okay, but what's important to recognize is that the two ports face similar challenges. We have the same type of operations in our, in our two ports. And so we have similar strategies that we can use. We can put solar fields out. We can build, lead buildings. We can electrify vessels or, and, and cargo handling equipment. So both of us will probably be doing some of those similar things. We will not be doing them together. Both of us are associated with the city. LA with the city of Los Angeles, Long Beach, and the cities uh, are responding to AB 32 as, as a city. So we have to be part of our city's plan. So the contributions and, and improvements that we make in Long Beach will be geared towards working with our city to help them achieve the goals of, of AB 32. Um, you're right, we have a lot of strategies in place or going in place right now. We're building infrastructure to basically electrify all of our berths so that vessels can plug into shoreside electricity and turn off their engines. We have new buildings that are being built to lead standards so that we reduce the uh, environmental footprint of those. We have uh, a variety of other programs, uh, including things as, as simple as, as tree planting and, 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 and the like that are all part of our strategy. And we have uh, our own plan, Long Beach, the, the Port of Long Beach has a plan and then that's integrated into the city's plan where we're implementing various measures to meet AB 32 and uh, uh, so let's see, AB 375 I think it is, the, the, the land use planning. So the answer is yes. It's a big challenge. It's a big challenge because we don't own or operate most of that equipment that, that you see coming in and out of the ports. And so the other um, stakeholders, the railroad, the vessel operators, they're all going to have to do their part as well on, on their own. Yes? I have two questions. The first one is um, just a very simple question. Is the electricity provider for Long Beach the same as uh, uh, No, uh, ours is Southern California Edison. Okay. And LA is LADWP. Okay. And, and the other question I have is, um, so I guess this is more of a, what's the main differentiation between you, what you would say between a Port of Long Beach and Port of Los Angeles in terms of, let's say, what's the difference in value proposition so that if I'm a shipper and uh -huh. I'm trying to decide, maybe the lease is up and I'm trying to decide between two ports, I mean, what's some of the different value propositions for the differentiation? Well, l l let, me, let me tease that apart a little bit. The terminals are not normally operated by the same people that operate the vessels. There are some exceptions to that. So those, and those terminals are limited. So they're very, um, if you uh, have a lease for a terminal, you're in a good position and you don't want to give that up. So the, the terminal operators will generally stay with us. Now the vessel operators, actually the people that ship their cargo on the vessels are the guys that decide what port they might want to go to. And that's a little bit more complicated. There's a whole lot of factors in there. But, but that's where customer service comes in, quite honestly. So Walmart and Home Depot and some of these other names that you guys are familiar with, they could put their cargo on the ships that call in Los Angeles, or they can put their cargo on ships that call in Long Beach. And we're hoping to demonstrate, and, and we've been very successful at that, of showing how customer friendly we are in terms of desirability and customer service and all those little buzzwords that you've heard that makes us the most desirable port. And we've seen the cargo start shifting to Long Beach because of that. And we hope it continues. Yeah. How disruptive to uh, your cargo growth do you expect the growth of other West Coast ports? Prince Rupert. Pr Prince Rupert, uh, well, there's two types of cargo. The cargo that is kind of captive here, that's the stuff that we're all consuming in this area, and discretionary cargo. We have lost, we have already lost some discretionary cargo to, to Prince Rupert. They are very competitive. They are going after our business. 
and uh, they have plans to grow. Right now, they're, they're limited in how, how much cargo they can handle, but we believe that they will try to expand their facilities and take more cargo. So what we have to do is be competitive in terms of our, our fees and charges as well as efficiency and customer service. And those are the things we're trying to capitalize on. We have a lot more environmental programs which require funding and so that's viewed from the out by the outside world oftentimes as being negative. They don't, they, they don't care about the environment, they just want to go the cheapest route possible so they'll send it to Prince Rupert or some other port. So we're trying to compete with that. Um, but uh, right now the capacity is limited to those other ways. In 2014, the Panama Canal will be wide, finished widening. And that will provide a route for the biggest vessels to go all water, stay in the water, and go all the way up to, to the Gulf ports and to the East Coast. Now it takes longer, but it could be less expensive depending on how your business is structured. We are looking forward to that being, uh, again, a challenge for us to compete with. Okay. Uh, just uh, to keep the pace with the estimated demand growth uh, from the EUs, mm -hmm. uh, is there like we need to, we must uh, need to in increase the capacity. But for example, to improve the gate capacity, mm -hmm. we have to reduce the transaction time. Mm -hmm. So is there any plan to have like automation technologies in the future? There is actually automated technology in place today at the gates. In the terminals, the, uh, it's a very complex interaction between labor, mm -hmm. current labor today, and their contracts and their control of the, the waterfront, so to speak, and the management of terminals who would like to automate a lot. They're slowly moving in that direction, probably not as fast as some people would like, but I think what you'll see is as a new generation of, 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 of labor who are less afraid of technology realize that that's the way of the future to keep business coming to the ports, they will learn to operate that technology and so there'll be less of the manual labor that was maybe there in the, in the early days of the ports. And so it's, it's a matter of, the, of that um, evolution taking place. But you're absolutely right. In order for us to compete globally and with Prince Rupert and everywhere else, we need to continue to modernize. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the last question, Sam. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke a lot about the, the regional infrastructure, how big of an impact that has on ports uh, operations. Mm -hmm. And the Alameda Corridor project, right. the result of a, a public private partnership. Um, do you see public private partnerships as a, a wave of the future in terms of regional infrastructure? Well, the, the Alameda Corridor was not a public private partnership. It was actually funded by the two ports. Uh, we formed the Alameda Corridor Tran uh, Transportation Authority, which was a, a basically uh, an entity to, to manage and, and provide bond financing. So we had some government grants, we had monies from the ports. The two ports uh, benefit, that's one of, one of the projects that I was uh, worked on early on in my career, buying that right away from the Southern Pacific Railroad going all the way up to, the, to, to downtown Los Angeles. Um, that was a very successful uh, in, endeavor. It's still obviously operating uh, very well. It, it's, it's below capacity right now and it will over the next several years start reaching capacity. Um, we think that was a great project. It's very uh, good for the environment and good for moving goods. Public-private partnerships are difficult. And the reason is that you have to have a revenue source to be that, pr to in order for a private investor to get involved into a port project. So for instance, we have a, a bridge project right now that people are saying, well, why don't we do a P3? Well, the, the reality is that you'd have to put significant tolls on all the other surrounding bridges uh, in the area in order to, to pay for at least part of the cost of this bridge. And what we found through a lot of research is that people will do anything to avoid a 50%, a 50 cent toll on a bridge. Now the trucks only represent about 25% of the traffic on that bridge, so that means that the rest of that, 75% of the traffic on that bridge, would, it, would, would go any way they could to avoid it. They would go on the surface streets, they go through neighborhoods, and all that is unintended negative consequences. So what we need to find out is if there's another way to get uh, monies to, uh, to pay back a, uh, an investor in a public private partnership. It's not out of the question, it's just some creative thinking has to take place, and so we haven't really crack that nut on that project. 
even after close the seminar, in yeah. view of the clock. Uh -huh. But you're welcome to uh, talk to Dr. Cantor after we close the seminar. You actually, I, I have, I, I'm going to have to actually hit the road, so I. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, but I think uh, we should thank Dr. Cantor for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you. Bye-bye.